Well, I wanted to tell our speaker that we have a tradition we always tell, economist joke of the month. Um, there's an important date coming up. Um, and no, I'm not talking about the minutes of the Federal Open Market Committee. I'm talking about Valentine's Day. And as economists, uh, I know you're not necessarily well known for your romantic proclivities, but I wanted to share a really important recommendation with you because as economists, we like to collect data and we like to analyze things. So the question comes up, what is the right number of flowers or the right number of chocolates to buy for your spouse, significant other, or like some economists, your pet? So. Um, let me give you a word of advice. Just go ahead and buy a dozen flowers or a dozen chocolates. Resist your normal instinct as an economist to do a multivariate analysis to determine where the curve of diminishing marginal returns goes to zero, okay? So that's, that's the advice for today. Thank you. Yes, just to uh, introduce today's speaker, I just wanted to introduce uh, President of the Atlanta Fed, Raphael Bostic. Oh, thank you, Ibrahim. And we did come here to hear, listen to you, so, so I'm glad we got to hear you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Pause work this time. It doesn't always work. Sometimes I have to reprompt people. It's good to, good to have you here, um, and it's really a pleasure to be able to introduce President Tom Barkin. Um, but first, I just wanted to say um, I'm really pleased that this club meets here. Uh, our bank really loves to support the activities of this organization and uh, helps spur some interesting discussions around where, what's happening in economic policy and and important companies around the uh, the region. So um, so please keep coming back. One of our functions is really to be an asset to the community, and this is one of the ways we want to do that. Um, today is actually, I, actually, I'm glad you mentioned the Super Bowl. Um, I feel like the Super Bowl was just a warm up for this, right? So <laughs> so uh, for 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 folks here. Um, this is, a, this is actually a big deal, and um, it is really exciting to have uh, Tom Barkin here. He's the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. Um, and Tom, I've known him for a long time. I'm not going to go into all of the, the, the history. Just suffice it to say he knew me uh, when I was a young tyke. I like to call myself a young tyke. It was a long time ago uh, when I was an undergrad uh, at Harvard. Uh, Tom was there. Tom has three Harvard degrees, uh, an undergrad, a JD, and an MBA, uh, and um, has used those to great effect. Um, he was a uh, longtime CFO and senior partner at McKinsey, um, and he was actually uh, the chair of the board of directors for the Atlanta Fed. So he was uh, very uh, well-versed on ways of the Fed before he took his current role. He started, uh, I guess, eight months after I did in 2018. Uh, so we have, uh, we're of similar vintage and we've seen quite a bit happen in the time uh, that we have been in role. Uh, Tom's one of my favorite people. I will tell you, he's uh, smart, he's insightful, um, he's funny, and uh, he doesn't suffer fools. And I, I, tr I, I aspire to do all of those things, uh, and uh, it's always just fun to have him around. So Tom, welcome to the building, welcome back to the bank, and look forward to your remarks. Uh, thanks, Raphael, for not telling any stories about the past. Um, uh, so it's great to be back in the Atlanta Fed, as uh, Raphael said. I joined the board here in 2009. Uh, it was a crazy time. Uh, and I uh, was so impressed uh, with the team in the Atlanta Fed. I just felt like I was working with the adults in the room. Uh, smart, well-intentioned, cared deeply about the country. And for those of us who were in business at the time, we were just so appreciative of what everybody did to get us to the other side uh, of the Great Recession. I also really appreciated Dave Altig, my personal tutor uh, in economics, who. I uh, spent a lot of time uh, reawakening my interest in the, uh, in the topic, and it's, as they said, as Tori Kayyem said in that famous commercial, I liked it so much I bought the company. <laughs> um, I also appreciate uh, 
uh, Raphael allowing me to spend the weekend in Atlanta here, which I've had a good time uh, on, on and do this. Um, we did join at the same time. Uh, we agree uh, so often. It, it's been a ton of fun. And um, there's a standard Fed disclaimer that one says before you give a talk, which is, um, you know, I speak for myself, not for anybody else in the Federal Reserve System. But for today, I'm speaking for myself and Raphael. <laughs> um, and so uh, if he says anything different in the Q&A, you know that he's just showboating. Uh, okay, so I, what I thought I'd do is uh, just spend 10 minutes talking about the economy uh, and then open it up to questions. I want to um, warn you I'm a lot more interested in answering questions than I am talking about the economy, so bear with me for 10 minutes. We'll have a lot more fun on the backside. Um, I should just start by saying uh, the data that's come in recently uh, has been remarkable, and I just think that's worth reflecting on for a second. I'll give you some numbers. 12-month PCE inflation is at 2.6%. Core inflation is down to 2.9%. Uh, if you looked at the last six months or even seven months, core inflation has been 1.9%. Uh, and the 12-month numbers that I gave you are only going to get better because uh, we're lapping over some numbers at the beginning of last year that were quite inflationary. And so those numbers are going to come down almost assuredly over the next few months. At the same time, uh, in contrast to almost every forecast, and certainly in contrast to mine, um, the progress in inflation has come while the economy stayed uh, remarkably healthy. Um, the unemployment rate, 3.7%. Uh, a week ago, we added another 353,000 jobs. GDP in the fourth quarter was 3.3%. Um, if you had given me the option at last year's Super Bowl of taking 2.6 uh, inflation and 3.7% uh, unemployment, I would have played that, that parlay. Um, now, uh, one of the things that inspired me about what the Atlanta Bank does uh, is the outreach it does in the communities um, and talking to businesses and trying to understand. And so I've tried to bring that to Richmond. Um, and, and when we're talking to the businesses in our district, uh, we're also hearing good news. I mean, it's confirmatory. Um, now, there are a couple sectors like banking and real estate uh, that are definitely um, hurting, but the tone in other sectors has turned decisively away from talking about uh, a recession. It's just a lot more optimism today than there was even three months ago. Um, on the job side, they may not be hiring as much, uh, but they're really not firing uh, either. And while price setters continue to try to do what they can, they seem more and more convinced that we're on the backside of the inflation cycle, that price increases will be smaller, uh, less frequent, and less likely to stick. Um, I take a lot of signal from the major consumer products manufacturers. If you look at their uh, most recent earnings reports, you'll see that uh, price increases, which two years ago were in the high teens and a year ago were in the low teens, today have come down to the low uh, single digits. So every conversation you have, you know, includes some conversation about whether we're headed toward a soft landing, where inflation comes back to our target, um, but the economy stays relatively healthy. And, and that could well happen. Um, if it does happen, it's going to defy almost all predictions of what happens when you raise interest rates as fast as we did uh, to fight inflation. It would also be uh, pretty impressive given some of the challenges we've faced in the last year, from the banking turmoil in the spring down to the Middle East crisis uh, in the fall. Now, you can explain it. Uh, you know, you can explain pretty clearly why inflation could settle quickly without uh, much disruption. You might credit the extraordinary levels of post-pandemic spending uh, finally normalizing. You might credit the painful post-COVID supply chain shortages finally being resolved. Um, you might look at the recent rebound in prime age participation and in immigration and say they've helped alleviate labor market pressures. And you might point to inflation expectations, which have stayed remarkably stable, um, suggesting that businesses and consumers have found the Fed and our target credible. In other words, they actually believe that the inflation surge we saw was temporary, and with the help of Fed action, it's now largely behind us. So, you know, then the next question, obviously, is why not just declare a victory? Why not just move rates back quickly to normal levels? And nothing would make me happier than uh, a return to the pre-pandemic economy. But I guess as I've tried to think about it, that's where we are. Are we in, a, are we in the pre-pandemic economy? We just need to call it. Um, I guess two reasons uh, for caution. First, uh, the plane hasn't landed yet. You know, we're, we're in the air. You can see the airport, um, but we're not on the ground. Um, and, and for the nerds among us, I like the visual of an unfinished negative parabola with the top being the peak of the pyramid. So 
GDP, pre-COVID, roughly 2%. At its peak, 5.8%. Now, 3.3%, right? Headed toward trend, which is probably 2%. We're not yet on the ground yet there. Um, uh, unemployment, three-month three, uh, three month average job growth. Before COVID was about 200,000. It peaked up in the 750,000 range. As I said, it's now in the you know, low 200s. Normal, most people would say, would be about 100. Uh, or inflation, which was just below 2% before COVID, up to 7 point something percent in uh, 2022. Now, 2.6% uh, or 2.9% on its way down to two. In all of these cases, you know, we're closing in on it, uh, but we haven't yet hit, uh, hit our target. Now, you could be a demand pessimist, and if you were a demand pessimist, you could point to monetary policy lags, credit tightening, the narrowness of job gains, and the potential for geopolitical shocks, and be still worried about a downturn. Or you could be an inflation pessimist and point to continued strong wage growth and strong equity values supporting spending and the recent drop in interest rates as fueling a potential reacceleration. The Fed's committed to returning inflation back to 2%, as you know. And as I think about that commitment, I can't help but think about uh, history. Uh, a good example that I like to reflect on is uh, the late 80s. At the, near the end of the Volcker era, inflation ca actually came down on a 12-month basis under 2%. It was about 1.5 in 1986. The Fed reduced rates, but a year later, inflation had escalated again, and it caused the Fed to reverse course and increase rates again. And, you know, if you could prevent that kind of roller coaster, obviously, you'd love to do that. So that's the first reason for caution, is just the plane's not on the ground. Um, but the second reason might be a little bit more fundamental. Um, there's an old saying that nobody returns from battle the ch unchanged. And while our war on COVID and our war on inflation uh, can't compare to the horrors of an actual war, I still wonder about how those experiences might have changed us, and in particular changed our economy. Um, you know, disruptive events do have lasting consequences. If you look at GDP growth uh, before the Great Recession, we took a big step down and we never returned uh, to that old trend. So what are the changes that worry me? Um, one is the labor market. Um, labor force participation is down. Um, employment is still over 4% below its pre-COVID trend. My generation, the baby boomers, is aging out of the workforce. Um, and participation has dropped as well in that segment. The market was tight before COVID. It remains even tighter uh, today. Uh, just to quote the Atlanta Fed's wage growth tracker, just one piece of evidence, um, wage growth is still running at 5% versus 3.7% uh, pre-pandemic. If anybody here thinks I have the wrong numbers, I know you're not going to tell me. Um, <laughs> this pressure on wages and potentially prices uh, is likely going to persist. So if the labor market stays tight for longer, that's a change that could create inflationary pressure. Another change is the housing market. Um, now, we lack housing supply. I gave a speech on this a couple of months ago. Um, we underconstructed for a generation. And then, of course, today we've got a shortage of skilled trades and a recent increase in construction costs. Demand has also increased. People were stuck 24 hours a day in their house. And the one thing you figure out when you're stuck 24 hours a day in your house is you need a new house um, or maybe a different roommate. Um, <laughs> in institutional investors added to demand, second home purchasers you know about, and so housing prices shot up across the board. Now the market's since cooled a little bit, but with limited supply, uh, prices remain high and they're still growing. And if housing supply remains short, that could mean further pressure on prices and rents in coming years. A third change could be deglobalization. Uh, now, COVID uh, laid bare the vulnerabilities associated with a globally complex supply chain. Uh, businesses and consumers became painfully aware that a series of unfortunate events, a severe winter storm, a fire at an overseas plant, a blocked shipping line, could snowball into snarled supply chains, good shortages, and a spike in costs. We're seeing countries rethink their trading arrangements and firms redesign their supply chains to prioritize resiliency, not just efficiency. And if you do have those changes, they suggest more cost pressure and less ability for intermediaries to drive year-over-year -year efficiencies. And these kind of forces could also put pressure on goods prices. So inflation is definitely slowing. I'm hoping that um, that slowing will broaden and be sustained. Um, but I do recognize that most of the drop so far has come from uh, a partial re reversal of pandemic-era 
goods price increases, which has more than offset continued uh, increases in shelter and other services inflation. Now, the Fed's not in the game of trying to pick the correct mix of inflation. Our target doesn't suggest, you know, how individual elements could change, uh, just that the price index overall should be 2% over time. But the factors I talked about could hinder the continued deflation in goods and maintain pressure on shelter and services prices. In addition, we've seen a recent rebound in consumer sentiment, continued willingness of consumers to dip into savings, and loosening of financial conditions, which could also bring risk to the inflation outlook. You could, submit, you could dismiss all these pressures as exerting only a fleeting impact on inflation in an otherwise stable environment. But I still worry they could influence expectations, which have been unsettled by the recent inflationary experience. The New York Fed's inflation uncertainty measure remains much higher than pre-pandemic levels. So it's possible we could return to the pre-pandemic economy pretty seamlessly. It's also possible the landing could be somewhat bumpier with continued inflation pressure or demand challenges that we'll need to counteract. And that's why I think it's smart for us to take our time. You likely saw in the meeting the week before last that we acknowledged that risk to employment and inflation are moving into better balance and that we don't expect it to be appropriate to cut rates until we get greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2%. Basically, nobody wants inflation to reemerge. And you're in a situation with robust demand, a historically strong labor market, that gives us time to build that confidence before we begin the process of toggling rates down. So uh, that's my little speech. Like I said, I'm open to uh, advice, uh, suggestions from anywhere but Raphael. And, uh, and let, let me know what I can tell you. <laughs> yeah? Well, so, I mean, there, there's a lot that's unique about the world we're in right now, but one of them is rates have gone up and housing starts are actually quite strong. If you look at the national home builders, I mean, they're out there building. Part of that is nobody's selling the existing houses, and so the only houses that are selling are the ones that are being built. But there's actually a lot of uh, activity there. If you told me that the activity went away, and it looks like it's going down significantly in multifamily, for example, um, you know, I just say we're doing something short term that helps you in the long term. And so the idea isn't to take rates up and have them stifle home building or multifamily forever. It's to bring inflation down. If you bring inflation down, then you normalize rates and you get to the back end of it. And so um, I get this question a lot, but it's, it's definitely a, a time horizon, you know, issue. Um, like the idea is not to stifle the economy. The idea is to bring inflation down. The faster it comes down, the faster we get back to normal. Yeah. So you served as CFO for a complex organization before you went to the Fed. I'm curious how that prepared you for what you're doing now. Um, so, uh, of course, I'm going to tell you how incredibly well prepared I am and what a <laughs> what a what a great job I'm doing. Um, but but I have to say I, I didn't walk in fully equipped to handle all the challenges of the job I have now. I mean, it's a hard job. And, um, uh, and, and you're joining a policy conversation mid, your policy strategy mid conversation. And so there's a lot out there that's happened that you don't know when you walk into the job. I will say my time as a consultant did teach me to listen before you talk, which um, isn't always that easy to do. Um, but you do learn a lot as you get in there. And you've got you've to figure out the conversation to be able to have the right kind of impact on it. And so I, I guess I'll start by saying that I'm not as, I wasn't as good as you were nice enough to suggest I might have been. Um, to, the, to, the, to the extent that it did help, I'd say two things. One is, um, you know, and I spend a ton of time in the market for just this reason. I do think I understand how businesses think about the economy. I do think I understand uh, how they think about the choice to raise prices uh, at disproportionate levels on a consistent basis, which is inflation or not. I do think I understand the choices they're thinking about now, whether do we cut our hiring or do we increase our firing. You know, I do think I understand how they interpret news and how that might go into business sentiment and therefore capital investment decisions. And so I was in the middle of helping them make those decisions for a long time. I've made them myself. And I think that there is some value there. 
um, I, I, I want to emphasize me just telling people that I know something that doesn't have that much influence. I actually have to bring that insight, not just say I bring that insight. And so I, I do spend uh, almost every week on the road. Um, Steve's here from Bloomberg. He knows because he travels with me a lot. But, you know, I mean, I'm doing that because I'm learning. And I'm trying to then bring that learning into the FOMC. And I think for anybody who walks into that room, you want to think about what you might know that could be distinctive and how you then leverage it. So that would be one. The second thing is we're making judgments all the time. And these judgments require a finely balanced, you know, sense of risk trade-offs. And again, it's not just similar to what a lot of businesses do, which is you have to make judgments without perfect information. And um, I think there's some amount of practicality uh, that you learn that hopefully is helpful in making uh, those judgments. Yeah? Tom, I think this might be the bone head question, but why does the Fed target inflation rather than a stable dollar? I don't think it's a bone head question. So the, uh, so the first thing I'd start with is uh, we didn't make up our target. Congress gave us the idea of target. Congress said stable prices and maximum employment with moderate interest rates. That's in the legislation. And so we didn't have a choice of saying target the dollar. We, those are the two things we target because that's what we've been directed. Uh, to target. Um, I thought you were going to go with then why is 2% the same thing as stable prices, well, which is a fair question. Um, and interestingly, there was a big debate in the 90s, I've read some of it, about whether uh, the target should be zero or should be some number. And, and interestingly, it wasn't between two and three, it was between one and two, you know, zero, one, or two. Um, which of those feels most like stable prices? And, you know, part of the reason that uh, by 2012 they ended up at two. Uh, as an explicit target is a sense that the, the numbers aren't well uh, measured, and so there's some slippage on the measurement. A good example would be encyclopedias. You know, uh, the price increase for encyclopedias was in the, in the, uh, in the index probably in the 80s. Today it's free because it's Wikipedia. So there's a set of things that have prices gone to zero, and so, you know, stable prices actually some of the stuff gets cheaper over time. Uh, the other reason is, I think there was a sense that deflation is truly a scary thing. When you believe the price tomorrow is going to be less than the price today, no one purchases anything today, that's Japan. And so uh, I think 2% gives you a little room to avoid the risk of, you know, inadvertently falling into deflation. So that's why uh, they did it. I guess the last thing I'd just say, because you asked about the dollar, is pretty hard to target. us. There's a lot going on in the dollar other than just interest rates. So you know, the health of various economies, you know, just but as one example. The number is published in 2% is the goal. Published number for inflation, yeah. yeah. But if you're, if you're going to focus on the dollar, there's just a lot of other things that work on the dollar other than interest rates. Yeah. Yeah? yeah? Sir, uh, lots of talk about the national debt. Mm-hmm. Well, so pressure on interest rates, I'm not focused on the national debt. I'm focused on inflation and unemployment, and, you know, we'll play that out. Um, uh, national debt, great question. Um, we get it a lot. Uh, some facts, uh, 1946, 106, uh, debt to GDP was 106 percent. Um, you know, over the ensuing 60 years, our forefathers, through a combination of occasionally you know, uh, prudent budgeting, and of course, the growth of the U.S. economy over 60 years had worked that down to 38 percent. So in 2007, um, debt to GDP was 38 percent. Today, it's basically just over 100 again. And the CBO just put out a new forecast that has it, you know, going well over the 106 percent uh, in pretty short order. Um, trees don't grow to the sky, and so there's some number out there at which, you know, the dead bird overcomes us. Um, whether that's tomorrow or 25 years from now, nobody knows the answer to. I mean, there are countries out there that I don't aspire to, to be. You know, Italy and Japan would be two of them that have much more significant debt loads and relatively low borrowing costs. But it, it must be the case that at some point, the people who buy the debt of this country will say, at this debt burden, I really don't like that risk profile. And the way that plays out is interest rates, especially on the long end, you know, would go up inadvertently. Uh, um, you know, in the early 90s, there was this thing called bond vigilantes that famously, uh, you know, uh, were very focused on um, 
debt and sort of did a set of things that motivated the then government of the U.S. to take some debt reduction measures. I don't know where they are today. Um, people are still buying U.S. debt for long-term U.S. debt for 4%. And at some point, if we keep on this financial path, people won't like the price. Yep. So the recent regulatory proposal for capital for larger banks mm -hmm. seems to have gotten a lot of comments. Yeah, this, any any positive comments or just uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah? So especially since it's pretty significantly different than the Basel III. Yep. Any thoughts? Is it going to be a new proposal? Or they go with what they have? Or, yeah. I mean, there's a process on this. So a proposal goes out. Um, people give comments. Um, I, I can assure you those comments are taken, they're read in depth and they're taken very seriously. And I think well-meaning people are going to try to take those comments and sort through, you know, what the right next step would be. Um, you know, I'm not closely involved in it, but, you know, for Fed now, when we put it out, I was more closely involved. And, you know, I saw the results of those comments and we absolutely take those things seriously. So I think you should expect that the comments that come in will be taken seriously and uh, the board will try to sort through what the right path forward is. Yeah. So, seeing what happened, you know, in 2023 and uh, inflation peaked and how quickly it came down, and surprisingly, nothing happened. The labor market uh, is still strong. So, my question is is the Phillips curve still relevant? Um, I thought you were going to take that in a different direction. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, so. Uh, how is that? So, um, so the Phillips curve, as originally designed, was price and wage, and I'm sorry, in unemployment and wages. And so, I mean, you saw what happened uh, in 2022 when we were well short of workers, and I think if you're well short of workers, wages go up. I don't think there's any question about that. Now, there's been an effort, you know, to extend it over time to say that's also going to affect inflation. And um, again, in 2022, when we were massively short of everything, including workers, I think you saw inflation spike. So whether you think it's the Phillips curve is relevant on this long part of it, I don't know. But it feels to me very relevant, you know, at the kink or, or up there. Um, uh, I, I think we're going to say when we get to the end of this inflation episode, I think we're going to have an opportunity to reflect on what we learned from all this. And... It's entirely possible that what we learn is that this is much more around expectations than it is around, um, you know, the Phillips curve. We might learn that. And you would learn that in particular if inflation continues on a very stable trajectory for the next period of time. And so that six months from now, 12 months from now, 24 months from now, we're saying, what was this? This was just a weird, you know, supply-driven shortage that led to a blip and, you know, because we behave, I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating for effect here, because we behaved so well and kept expectations entrenched, you know, it all came down. We, we might learn that, but we might learn that inflation's stickier, it takes longer. I, we'll see what we learn. Um, and I think it's premature to decide that we've learned. As a, and that's kind of where I am in general, which is declaring victory at this point feels pretty bold. I think we're going to learn what we learn over the next, you know, year or so. And I think that'll be critically important, I think, to your question. Yeah? Have, have events in the economy in recent years changed the way you prepare for F1C meetings? Uh, do you ask questions you didn't used to ask for anything like that? Ask everyone how they're feeling beforehand. And, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, well, for sure, um, and so when I started, uh, you know, we were getting the data, and I, I was trying to ask my team for real-time data. How do we actually know this is accurate? What do we learn? And um, it, it, there were all kinds of constraints to doing it, many of which were in our own heads. Um, but I think when COVID came, all of a sudden you needed real-time data. And so we've invested in a you know little apparatus that I use every week to talk about how I think the economy is doing. Some unconventional sources, credit card data from some of the bigger banks, um, some of the job openings data that comes out in a higher uh, frequency. And, um, and so for sure I'm looking at that data and am more calibrated on that data than I was, 
you know, four years ago. So that's a very clear uh, strength. The, the other thing I'll just say has had to be some mental agility, and it relates to the Phillips curve question. I mean, uh, they just released the transcript for 2018, so I went back and read it to see if I said anything stupid. Um, but uh, I won't prejudge that. But, um, but it was interesting to read the 2018 transcripts because so much of what we talked about in 2018 was tariffs and what their impact would be on the economy and what it would be on business sentiment. And, you know, we may be in an era coming forward where tariffs return to the conversation 